As we wait for everybody to dial in, I'm going to begin to share our antitrust policy notice. We show this at the beginning of every meeting in the Linux Foundation. The notice is now being shared. The antitrust policy is available on our website. If you have any questions about it, you can ask us uh, via our council, Andy Updegrove, if you're a Linux Foundation member. Of course, you can also ask questions to myself and others, and we'll refer you to the appropriate people. Now, today's meeting is going to be a relatively informal meeting. This is the first of the Export Control Working Group, and this means that we're going to be talking about a topic that's new for us in the open chain community, but one that people have expressed a lot of interest in. Now, I will talk us through the agenda briefly. The first thing we'll do on this call is have some introductions. We have quite a few people after dialing in. Uh, we have 18 people on the line and one person marked as just joining now. The introductions, I will call out the names or the other IDs I see in the users. And please just introduce yourself with your name and your company as appropriate. After the introductions, we're going to have a little overview of why export control matters from the perspective of open source and compliance. We're not going to go too deeply into that today, just a broad overview to help set the discussion for our conversation. And then we will go into that open discussion about what OpenChain can do around export control. Before we get started, I just want to make one note, which is that we're not going to pretend that OpenChain is in a position to give advice around export control. We're not going to be talking about OpenChain making an export control standard. Uh, this is really about, first of all, talking about export control and open source, and from there, thinking about what we can do around it. The reason I'm putting those limitations on this first call is because I want to set expectations carefully. We have to be cautious around something like export control because it's such a sensitive area. Let's dive right in so we can move to the open discussion sooner rather than later. Why is export control important? Why are we here today? You may be familiar with the fact that export control and open source is a topic which used to be more controversial than it is today. Back in the early 90s, there were challenges around open source technology and cryptography. Most famously, a technology called Pretty Good Privacy, PGP, uh, was something that couldn't be exported across the US borders. And this led to an interesting challenge uh, regarding how <laughs> that was overcome. Uh, and this is broad sweeps, of course. Bear in mind, I'm not going into the, the details of what happened, and I don't expect to uh, describe something that was done in a legal manner. I'm not giving legal advice or legal insight. But basically, in 1991, PGP encryption was something that challenged export control around cryptography and individual determination of you know, what, what could be exported and what couldn't. I'm going to share the screen very briefly just to show you the Wikipedia article on that. And I'll put the link uh, to that article into our chat. Uh, long story short, uh, this PGP activity was something that built on um, the idea that export control applied to things like cryptography. PGP was freely available on the internet. And what did that mean for export control and so on and so forth? There were all kinds of discussions about how it could cross borders, what limitations were appropriate, what were not, et cetera, et cetera. 
And that's when the discussion kind of kicked off around, let's say, open technology and export control. And the broad sweep of our status is that most of the time when we talk about export control and open source, we're normally talking about cryptography or traditionally we've been talking about cryptography. By and large, um, open source developed freely around the internet is developed collaboratively and worldwide. And by and large, the open source community has in recent decades not been too concerned with export control in the context of open source projects acting on open source global websites, et cetera. But of course, export control remains a concern and something that you need to pay attention to in every jurisdiction uh, when it comes to open source included in a product. It's one thing for people to download, let's say, open source cryptography from a website and that open source code to be potentially used. It's another thing for us to ship open source with, let's say, cryptography across borders. Naturally, when we're shipping a product, we have to obey the rules in those particular borders. So we've often been looking at this from open source in a product and open source cryptography. Oh, now, when it comes to export control, it's back on our radar, uh, partly because we have new tensions in the world. So recently, we've had some challenges uh, with sanctions. And these sanctions apply to the tensions between the United States and China. Uh, and now there's sanctions regarding the Russian aggression towards Ukraine and the global sanctions against that country. This is in addition to what we could call traditional sanctions against certain entities like North Korea and of course, Iran. Long story short, when you think about sanctions around, let's say, can I export this? Can I move it into this geography? Sanctions coverage has increased dramatically. And as you may have noticed with the news recently, the sanctions coverage is getting pretty broad. So it's interesting to note that certain types of manufacturing around silicon is being limited towards um, export to China, for example, from the US and some US allies. It's interesting to note how much things like silicon and software are converging with software defined silicon. And it raises potentially questions. As more places are covered by sanctions, as more software goes everywhere, will we be facing new questions around export control? Now that summary is going to be summarized again. We first thought about open source and export control in the early 90s. And basically that was regarding US export control, cryptography and individual use of cryptography technology. To what extent could individuals share code? To what extent could that code cross borders? And then the fact that if you put something on the internet, it was crossing borders regardless. More recently, We've tended to think about export control in the context of open source projects are developed collaboratively worldwide. That open source code, where it is as a collaborative project is usually not a huge concern regarding export control. But when we put it in products, obviously those products are subject to whatever export controls there may be on national borders. And then we have the development in sanctions where the world has got increased tensions and more and more technology is covered by sanctions between jurisdictions. And interestingly, of course, with things becoming software defined and everything becoming open source, that means the amount of export control, the amount of sanctions applying to stuff is perhaps going to intrude more frequently in what we do. So the open discussion the reason we're here today is going to be to chat about that a little bit. Now, before we do the open discussion, I'm going to do that brief introduction. So I'm going to ask that as I call out your name, please unmute yourself and just let us know what company or organization you're from. So first of all, Anastasia. Hello, everyone. I work for ARM or IRM. I don't know how you prefer to call it. Good to have you here. 
Anton. Uh, hi, Sean. <laughs> um, I work at Ambition. It's a um, subordinate of Mercedes-Benz. And indeed, we were talking just a couple of days ago in Cologne. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Barbaros. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm working for Roland Schwarz in Munich, Germany, and we met last week also in Cologne. Bernie. Hello, um, I work for ARM in the Galway office. Katharina. Hi. Uh, Software Compliance Academy. Thanks, Hi. Shane. It's two of us. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, there's two of you. Right. I, I'm sorry. It was Katharina of C. <laughs> <laughs> so Katharina number one is um, Software Compliance Academy, and Katharina number two. I'm from PwC. We have Great. also met last week. Great to have you here. Oh, hey, with the presentation. Yes. That was a very good presentation. Thanks, Shane. Cecilia. Don't worry if you can't unmute yourself. We'll come back. Oh, there you yeah. go. Yeah, uh, it's Gabrielle Thorsen. I'm using my daughter's account here, uh, working for Ericsson Sweden. Good to have you here, Danielle. Hi, this is Daniel Nord, uh, also working for Ericsson uh, with trade compliance and so sanctions, export controls, and so forth. Excellent. Geese. And I always mispronounce your name, so please correct me. Hello. Um, so I'm Gilles. Okay, Gilles. You, you'll never get it right. <laughs> so I, nobody I, I, does. 16 years. I'm going to have to get it right one day. Okay, <laughs> so I'm from Wipro, and yeah, Shane, we met last week, but uh, in Stuttgart. <laughs> yes, we did. We were Small at, world. At so, uh, and just uh, as a as a heads up, I was involved in the uh, the, the the French uh, crypto um, liberalization in 1998 that triggered uh, Vassenar afterwards. So, a little bit of experience in this space. Fantastic. And I have the T-shirt that you mentioned in the in the PGP. <laughs> yes. The, the one with the code. Yeah, exactly. See? Ta-da! Nice. For those of you who don't know, one way that PGP crossed borders was that people literally printed the code and moved that, which was an interesting way of um, moving stuff across the borders for individual use. It circumvented the export control of software and went for freedom of, of uh, expression because it was a work of art, a book. So it was printed and then rescanned on the other side. And this is the type of loophole that drives policymakers crazy. <laughs> Holly. Hi, everyone. I'm Holly um, and I work for Source Code Control, a UK headquartered open source consultancy. Hacken. Yes. Hogan Osby. I'm working for Ericsson Ospo, and we met in Stockholm, Shane. Great to have you here. Arena. Hi, everyone. I'm working also for Ericsson in uh, Romania, Bucharest. Jacob. Hi, this is Jacob Wilson, and I'm with uh, Gemini. Good to have you here. Julian, and forgive me if I get your second name wrong, Kosia? Kocha. Kocha. Yeah, and we have two Julians too, but I go first by alphabetical order. Um, I'm uh, with ScanOSS. I'm ScanOSS's CTO, and I used to work with Hogan Amsberg in, uh, uh, at Ericsson, um, dealing with uh, export control as well for incoming open source and sourcing. Good to have you here. And now we move to Julian number two. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is Julian Schauder from PwC in Germany. Good to have you here again. It's uh, been a couple of days. <laughs> I missed you. So, Jan. Jan just dialed in, so he mightn't be ready to go yet. Okay, Lennart. Uh, yes, hello. My name is Lennart Zeck, and I'm from BMW. Uh, we also saw uh, last weekend. <laughs> In Stuttgart. Europe is incredibly small place. We keep bumping into each other. <laughs> okay. 
Marcel. Hi, Shane. Here's Marcel from Bosch IO. Uh, and I'm also the second Marcel because I have to switch to the phone now. Uh, okay. But I have my colleague with me, so he will be then the, the main contact for this topic. Understood. Matthew. Hi, everyone. I'm Matthew. I'm from Arm. Maximilian. Hey, I'm Max. Um from TNG and my experience with export control was um, I think seven years ago implementing some fields in SW360 for tracking export control in that tool, but um, just following along here. Nice. Nicola. Hi everyone, uh, nice to meet you. That's my first meeting all together regarding all of this. So I'm from Bosch IO and as Marcel mentioned, I'll be the point of contact from now on. Very cool. So we have Open Forum Europe. I'm guessing uh, this might be Aster. Yeah, indeed it is. It seems like overnight Zoom has removed the option of changing my the name after login. So I've been sitting here trying to figure it out, but it's me, Aster. I work at Open Forum Europe. Um, my name maybe later will be changed uh, or I'll just we log in with my my own account. Um, uh, experience of export control uh, very limited, uh, but um, good to hear that it's been dealt with in the past. But we'll see what comes up next. Right. Absolutely, Stefan. So trying to switch on my camera. Um doesn't work. So hi, I'm Stefan. I'm with uh, Atrovia AG in Germany. We're the central IT service provider for the German cooperative banks and uh, of course a highly regulated environment. Uh, so far we had a little contact with export control, mainly aroused uh, around discussion, uh, getting our open source usage in order and uh, yeah, had some contact with the uh, US American export uh, administration regulations, etc., but not that far. Excellent. Ninjoji san. Oh, wait, sorry, Stephen first, and then Ninjoji san. Hello, I'm Stephen Kilbane, and I work for Analog Devices. Uh, my experience with export control is having convoluted conversations with our export control department. <laughs> Ninjoji san. Uh, hello. Uh, hello, everyone. So this is Sakashi Nijoji from, uh, I'm working for Toolship Corporation Japan. Uh, yes, I know there are a lot of things to take care of export control in terms of trading and information sharing among group companies uh, within Toolship also. I'd like to learn a lot from your discussion this time. Thank you. Good to have you here. And finally, uh, Thomas. Hi, this is Thomas from PwD Germany's legal department and risk management. I usually try to stay clear of any export control matters, um, but as I have the IP and open source angle, so it may reach me nevertheless. Excellent, excellent. Uh, okay, now diving into our open discussion, uh, when it comes to the type of things we might want to talk about, we might want to talk about the supply chain and export control. And one learned experience we have around license compliance is that the vast majority of the supply chain not only is not great at license compliance, but they have very little awareness of license compliance. So I suppose one question that comes to mind would be, is there a lot of education around export control to do in the supply chain? Are there likely to be small suppliers who just don't know and could wander into problems? Second point we might want to talk about is that export control makes people nervous. As one person joked a couple of weeks ago, if you get license compliance wrong, in financial terms, you get a slap on the wrist. If you get security wrong, maybe you're going to have a couple of hundred million dollars in fines. If you get export control wrong, you're going to jail. <laughs> so this is, this is where, um, you know, it's a very serious matter. And we're going to have to be careful how we talk about it because we never want people to get the impression that we're able to solve export control for them. 
And we don't want to give people advice that could be misunderstood as trying to go around export control or advice that could be misunderstood as suggesting open source is more dangerous than other software regarding export control. So we're gonna have to choose our words carefully. Uh, I see we just had someone else join our meeting, I believe. They're just dialing in. Uh, Mary, uh, you are welcome to the meeting. And just in case you're not able to unmute yourself yet, we've been introducing each other with just our name and our company. If you can unmute yourself and introduce yourself, that would be great. If not, no worries. I know who you are. <laughs> we've got Mary Wang from Volvo on the line. Right, so kicking off the export control discussion, the first question I'd like to ask, and please answer freely, remember this is an informal discussion, we are recording it, so we shouldn't reveal any opinions or details that you know we don't want public, but the basic question I have is, do you think that the supply chain might lack sophistication on occasion around export control? Have you ever had the impression that there might be similar challenges regarding export control to what we see with license compliance, where maybe many companies are good at it, but smaller companies might be resource challenged and have difficulties in dealing with this topic. If no one has a comment at this juncture, that's fine. Uh, I'm just looking for general perspectives here on the topic. Well, I can share my opinion from analog devices. Sure. Um, so we regularly get education from our export compliance team. Um, they do have a fairly extensive course that they do. And that is primarily focused around hardware because we're primarily a silicon vendor, but it also covers software as well. And in my experience, uh, our software developers by and large don't seem to follow the, the concepts too well. It's fairly involved. But equally, we have a, a difficulty with the fact that we have conversations regarding the export compliance requirements for open source being used in a product. And my experience is that the export compliance team doesn't really understand open source. They know what software is. They know, in theory, what open source is, but they don't seem to have the concept of you've included not just a piece of software that you know in detail, but you've included 150,000 open source components that you cannot possibly know in any kind of detail. So yes. the question of does any of this software in your product that you're shipping use a encryption is something that cannot conceivably be answered um, in the current state of affairs without reading every line of source code and comprehending it. And that's a big gap in awareness as far as I'm aware. That's such a good point. Oh, Julian, I see you're I, on mute. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I can make a comment. There are tools uh, for detecting presence of cryptographic algorithms in, in code. There's been tools for many years. Uh, some are better than others. Uh, you know, and, and being part of ScanOSS, I can tell you that we do identify presence of um, cryptographic algorithms. Now, the, the challenge here, I mean, I just did, going through some notes of, of some of the things you say, Shane, um, yeah, the the problem with um, um, sanctions now, it, it is one problem, but it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, export control is, I mean, part of trade compliance applies to any product delivered to any country, regardless of whether or not there are sanctions. And the challenge here is the amount of open source. I mean, 75% of, of uh, code is open source. And then there is another element, which is, you know, rule number one when it comes to implementing uh, cryptography is do not make your own cryptography, which means that maybe 100% of the crypto cryptography we use comes from the open source. And if not, maybe 99%, but most of it most likely comes from the open source world. So it, it is a challenge to identify, but then there is another challenge in which I believe the, there is a need for consensus and, and finding common ground. I mean, uh, working with uh, Hawkins team at, at Ericsson, I remember the, the challenge of classifying. I mean, we, because the input to export control is the list of algorithms. 
which algorithms you're using is what defines the strength and of, of the of the of the encryption included in a product and whether or not this a standard um, uh, encryption and this is something that every country has its own rules and regulations and then every company has its own interpretation for these regulations so every company maintains a list of these algorithms and their classifications so i think that it will make a lot of sense to find common ground and establish um, the means for people to to actually get a common understanding a global understanding of this because if if we had in in an ideal world a list of algorithms that we we can use you know this will definitely lower risk and expense for everybody so maybe i, I just went off uh, the 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 track here but i mean this is my my message what i believe will be very helpful to to achieve and in the beginning you say uh, shane that we are not looking at doing or standardizing export control like like uh uh, like you guys managed to do with um, license compliance, but I see this as another compliance aspect that also has um, huge room for for improvement and and consensus and common ground. You raise a, a very interesting point. Well, two interesting points. The first is that, in general, export control, as you say, is export control regardless of sanctions. It's export control as what can leave this border or not to the rest of the world and there may be some special exceptions to close allies but it's a general thing um, and then the sanctions are something that were lumped in because our community had mentioned that that was on their mind um, as an adjacent matter uh, but of course sanctions are very targeted they're targeted towards certain geographies so it's a, a narrower issue than generalized export control Though with sanctions spreading rapidly, it's on people's radar. So it's a very good point. And of course, we mustn't underestimate the fact that export control departments have a great deal of experience in this stuff. So if there's a gap around open source and let's say open source program offices, to some extent, that's our own fault. <laughs> there, there are experts here uh, and there's some on this call who know this field extremely well and can provide information. And that leads us to the second point, which is that open source and export control has tended to be company internal. And for understandable reasons, companies are making to some degree judgment calls, but there's plenty of stuff where companies have just read the literature and identified what can and cannot cross borders. And as Julian said, I'm not aware of any shared resources around that. In fact, when you look for open source and export control, um, mostly what you find is this stuff, the t-shirt that we talked about earlier, which is about you know, open source communities uh, challenging export control and finding loopholes, uh, sometimes in a normative or political manner. And so, we, we have that interesting situation where a lot of the knowledge around export control and open source is fairly shallow when it comes to how do we share this stuff? How do we understand this stuff? Uh, and it, it tends to be biased towards let's get around this stuff, which is not the conversation that we're having today. The conversation we're having today is export control. How does it impact our field? So Julian, you raised an interesting point. Would it be possible for us at some juncture to at least get the discussion started about to what extent we could have common understanding around common things uh, regarding what's, what's covered? Let's say the algorithms. You know, I'm sure that it's not actually that difficult to make a list of what algorithms are easy to cross the US border. Um, do we have a list of what algorithms can cross the German border or the U UK border or the Chinese border? I, I'm not sure I've ever seen anything like that. Can I add something? Of course. I, I just posted a link to a document uh, that actually covers uh, the American side of things and explains uh, what is exempt from export control and what is not. Um, it's It's not simple, but it it does cover quite a few of these uh, uh of the aspects we're looking for 
Um, it's old, but it covers the ITAR classification. And then what you need to do is probably look at the latest versions of ITAR. But um, every country is going to have a different uh, a, a different uh, set of rules as to which algorithms are covered or not. Um, and um, and it, it gets trickier. Um, I, I used to work for a company that, that, that did quantum based cryptography um, which is um, which is not cryptography but uses quantum physics properties of photons to make communications non-observable so it doesn't fall under cryptography regulations but it's the strongest cryptography you can imagine on the planet because it's physically not eavesdroppable so, and that gets that gets people really nervous but um but again every every uh Every country will have a different set of rules, except those that participate in common, uh, in in common, um, you know, pools like Vasana or, or something like that. An excellent link, an excellent resource, and maybe this indicates that we could take a starting point of trying to find what resources are out there and pointing to them. Katharina just put a link in as well. I'm just trying to open it. There used to be a web page a long time ago that listed for um, each country the cryptography export control rules uh, or presence. And maybe, you know, uh, we could either um, uh, find that document if it's still out there. I'm happy to go look for it, but uh, it, it's it's all old, old, old stuff. Um, or uh, we could actually just create our own list. You know, if somebody wants to uh, to contribute to a... To, um, uh, doing some research and finding for each country and 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 pu putting that all together. That's an awesome offer. I'm just going to say, if you can take that as an action item to try to find that old resource, uh, that will be super cool. Yeah, I'm I'm looking for it. Thank you. So that that's your action item. You've been yeah. volunteered. Now I opened a link, uh, which is actually Mishi and Michael. Goodness, I was just talking with Michael today uh, on export control from, oh, it's open source law policy and practice, the book that was just released recently. I've got a chapter there too. Uh, so there's a chapter on export control on this Oxford University Press book. It was edited by Amanda Brock and you find many of us from the open source community on compliance management law have written in that. Uh, so the export control chapter gives checklists, subject matter. Oh, that's quite useful. So that's a great resource. Uh, Stefan has shown a link as well. Uh, it was just a reply to the uh, comment from Jill because uh, regarding strong cryptography and export control in the US American ER. Uh, for for our limited use case within uh, banking, we were happy to see that there's actually an exemption from uh, export control for strong, uh, strong cryptography for banking use or money transactions, and uh, that saved, uh, saved the day for us back then. But uh, however, um, it was a discussion regarding one of our mobile apps where... Uh, well, our product management just uh, opened up distribution of our apps uh, to all regions that uh, actually are aware there in the uh, Apple App Store, etc. And that was just a case of, uh, yeah, more, more research back then. Fantastic. Oh, by the way, I see Daniel is unmuted. Daniel, do you want to jump in with a comment? Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Daniel from Ericsson. Uh, group Functional Legal Effects and uh, I work with trade compliance. Um, <clears throat> we got to open source uh, and then export controls. I mean, the encryption is, is not that unsimilar between different countries. We got to the export controls. There may be some who have added some encryption on, on, uh, on national export controls as well, but to, some, but to a large extent, they are similar and they are based on the Vassan arrangement. And we see the same control is being adopted by countries in Asia now as they uh, introduce their own national export control systems. They simply copy paste either the US version or the EU version. And those versions are, are based on the Vassana arrangement ones. So they are fairly similar, but there may be differences with regard to import controls. You have countries such as France, 
Poland, Bulgaria, and a few other countries where you need to then report what type of software with encryption that we are importing into the country. But that's sort of slightly outside of the issue. I think for open source, it's it's useful to bear in mind that if it is published and available, freely available on a public website, then it actually per se is outside of at least US export controls. Um, from, from a US perspective, it's, it simply makes no sense in, in trying to control something that is freely available for everybody to, 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 to download and, and, and use. So, so that's one way uh, of sort of limiting how you need to engage with export controls. It's ensuring that whatever you produce is then made free to develop for, for others to use. But then, of course, when that uh, software is introduced into a product and, and made into something, well, then uh, that product may, of course, be under export control. So you need to apply for the applicable license and do a classification and so forth. But if it is freely open, available, then it's published, and then it's uh, per definition outside of US export controls. That's useful to know. And another thing which could also be useful to know is that. If you work in, in a cloud environment, what matters is really where the cloud is, is based, where the, where the servers are based. So, because if you're not really downloading anything, uh, there is no real export taking place. There's no real transfer take, taking place. So if, if, for instance, if I'm based in, uh, well, Sweden, for instance, and I'm working inside a US cloud, and that's where I do my work, but, uh, and work does not, I do not download it to my laptop, I do everything in, in there. Then also that will be, uh, there will be no export taking place. So therefore the export controls will, will not be applicable in that uh, context either. On sanctions, of course, you need to screen uh, whomever you are interacting with. And that sort of runs for every, well, for some sanctions such as against Russia that runs very, very broad, and for other countries, it may be uh, maybe a bit uh, more narrow, a bit more targeted. But that's sort of a, that's sort of slightly different uh, a challenge, which is more difficult to, to come around, so to speak. That's just my 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 quick uh, reflections on this uh, discussion so far. Thank you. Super useful. Thank you, Daniel. I see Stephen, your hand is up. Over to you. Thank you. So I saw a presentation um, a year or so ago on this topic. I, unfortunately, I cannot remember who uh, did the presentation. For all I know, it's somebody on this call, so I apologize. But the key point the presenter was making was that the laws change from time to time and from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and they're subject to interpretation and where you're shipping your product to and so on. All of those things keep on changing. What doesn't change is the attributes of the software that you're shipping. So. From my point of view, the first thing to worry about is what does the software actually contain and expressing that would be a first step in trying to have common information, a common means of expressing what a given piece of software contains. And therefore you can have the interpretation about whether it is of concern in your particular usage of that software. Great feedback, Stephen, thank you. Now, I noticed, Mary, you had yourself unmuted. Um, do you want to add anything here or uh, not? Uh, I I don't have um, that much to contribute to it, but I do uh, got contacted uh, some months ago by Volvo Cars Export Control Team. Since I'm leading the open, open, open source area, so there's connection. But unfortunately, as you mentioned, they don't know that much about the open source area yet. So we will reconnect again. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good feedback. And, and that's probably one of the areas, uh, one of the reasons that our community kept saying, hey, let's talk about export control. Because the open source teams and the export control teams mightn't have spent as much time talking to each other as we could. So there might be a real gap to share knowledge across. And I think open source is quite connected with the engineering or development teams, but export control is even more in the cloud, let's say. <laughs> Understood. 
Julian, I see you're unmuted as well. Yes, I'm sorry. I was trying to figure out how to raise my hand. I, I can't do that. <laughs> I saw that someone <laughs> did it, but sorry about that. Uh, one thing, this is just an, an, an open question. And, and just I was just thinking about what uh, Daniel was saying about the, uh, if the open source is already published and, and where is it published. And I'm thinking that we don't have anyone, I believe, from the software heritage in the call. But uh, just to, to throw this in, in, to, the, to the open, uh, what happens then when everything is mirrored? I mean, the, the, uh, for those not familiar, the software heritage aim, aims at uh, creating um, a perpetual archive of open source. So the open source or the, the open source component that you are using could be located in, um, in the original repository, but there is also a copy in France and the mirrors of the of the software heritage does that add any any value is that any useful in any way i just thought i'll, I'll mention that because that is uh, pretty much all open source is also available there that's a really good point point. and julian maybe uh we can explicitly reach out to software heritage and see if they've had discussions around this or not now uh, i noticed we have a few more comments. First of all, our intrepid warrior to find the website about cryptographic uh, rules and application in different countries is it's here. It's quite old, but it's a very comprehensive resource. We could you know, work on this one and update it or whatever. Let's just pull one up here. I'm choosing Ireland because that's my own long abandoned country. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it has information about export control. And as you say, it's old, uh, but there's information and I wasn't even aware of this website. So the existence of this website covering so many countries. At there, the was very, a, there was yeah. a time I used it extensively. <laughs> and it was updated last in 2013. Yeah. That's not so long ago, really. So it's not too badly outdated. Excellent. Okay. I wasn't aware of this at all. Um, Mary, your hand is up. Over to you. Yeah, yes. So thank you. Uh, uh, since I have worked in this um, area a little bit before in Ericsson, uh, I'm just thinking today, because the tooling and everything is changing today. So for our scanning tool today, is that kind of can get these encryptions and the countries automatically from all of the open source component? Oh, that's pretty good. Instead of manually handle this, if we really need this information, then today I know in World Cars export control people probably using by asking people. <laughs> <laughs> so um just to clarify, do you already have tools for that or you're just you're saying it will be useful to have tools for that? We don't have a tool for that. I'm just wondering, I mean, if since we are in CICD mode mm -hmm. nowadays, try to avoid as much as possible the manual work or the big work nowadays. So I'm just wondering in the open source area, do we have any kind of this functionality to get this information automatically? It's a question. <laughs> it's a good question. Julian, I see you unmuted. Maybe you have a partial answer. Yes, I think that I commented this, Mary, before you joined the, the meeting. Um, uh, ScanOSS provides a list of um, cryptographic algorithms um, contained in every open source that is identified. So that is one uh, solution to the problem. Mm, great. That's very good for the collecting the data for the export control team. Great. <clears throat> now we have um, a comment from Stefan, maybe a question to everyone in the chat. I've been talking to some people in charge of open source management at the German Federal Agency. The engineers were really keen on participating in and contributing to open source projects. However, they were turned down by their legal department because of quote, un, end quote, export control. That is, if they're not sure that there is no access from export controlled states, they're not allowed to contribute. <laughs> Has anyone encountered that 
uh, in the context of open source contributions. Now that's the second time I've heard it. Um, a person at the meeting we had, the Open Change German work group, mentioned that their company had said the same thing about contributing to open source projects, that unless they could be sure that their contributions were not going to be affected by um, export control, that they wouldn't go to states where export control applied, then they couldn't contribute. Um, maybe an addition from me might be, we've been talking to the same person. <laughs> But uh, um, in course of that, I asked our own legal department at Arhuvia and I just got an analysis that was completely different. So uh, to me, it was said it isn't a problem at all. So might be some kind of misconception, but uh, here I see some kind of, uh, yeah, general clash between the general openness of open source by definition and, uh, yeah, the concept of expert control. So uh, here, especially, I think they uh, were afraid of actually putting up OSS contributions to maybe GitHub or uh, without having the control that not someone from Libya, Syria, North Korea, or Cuba, the usual lot, uh, would have access to that. May I come in? I would agree with your legal department's assessment, Stefan. I mean, you can compare it that if you go to, if you participate in a conference and you publish a paper, which of course then will be available for participants and others to download, that you would then be held responsible if someone from, uh, you know, whatever ex exist on uh, some, some, uh, some sense the country would download it. Uh, that is not uh, what export controls are about. They are about denying technology, products and items that you have under control from reaching uh, either uh, entities or individuals or countries that you do not want to uh, want them to have access to it. So uh, so I, I would agree with your legal department's uh, assessment. Thank you. And this touches on a very interesting point. It's, it's completely valid that um, legal departments would say, let's not take any risk here. And I guess what we should maybe put as a note is that while we won't be, wherever this conversation goes, we're not going to encourage uh, by any measure recklessness. Our habit has been to encourage caution. Um, our contribution might be to help reduce any knowledge gap there might be, uh, which is, is very separate from risk mitigation based on making a judgment call. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, it, it's legal's department to, to say, don't take a risk if you don't have to. So that, that's uh, something that I think we should never forget and we should make sure that people understand that um, at all times, that whatever knowledge we might collect, whatever conversations we have, uh, we need to bear in mind that the legal departments of companies are trying to protect the company. And that will mean taking extremely cautious stances, especially around something like export control. Uh, there was a, a couple of comments in the comment section. Steven said, maybe we should start collecting a list of tools that can detect crypto content in open source. Uh, on this call, we now know that uh, ScanOSS can do it, but we have a lot more to learn. Julian said, would it make sense to make a list of algorithms and their classifications too? Um, I guess it could. Uh, I don't know. We'd have to probably ask the export control people and maybe get some informal feedback from legal people to make sure that If we started noodling on a list, no one would mistake that list as being canonical. <laughs> you know, no one would think, oh, this says it's okay, so that's fine. That we, we wouldn't want that to ever occur. Uh, but Stephen concurs that it would be useful if a list existed to say that, oh, this stuff might be subject to export control and tools like this can detect it. Stephen, over to you, your hand is up. Yeah, so uh, again, this comes back to interpretation. Um, in terms of being able to have a list of algorithms, definitely. Uh, classifications, that can vary, but uh, it's also good to be able to express that and have a common way, of common way of expressing it. But also I think not just algorithms, but attributes of the algorithms, things that are factually based, 
mathematically based, which don't vary from interpretation to interpretation. So you can say this tool will, will detect this kind of thing, and then you can have mapping onto that what that interpretation might be in a given jurisdiction, say. So I'm, I'm talking about two different things in terms of uh, a common list of classification, depends on what you mean by classification, whether you mean the export control legal classification or whether you mean a classification of, a, of an algorithm, mathematically speaking. And I think both are useful in terms of standardizing terminology. A very good point. And Julian added that he thinks uh, the classification would be useful if it went between strong or not, standard or not. Julian, you're unmuted, over to you. Yes, I'm still trying to figure out how to raise my hand, sorry. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, basically the input to the actual e ECCN classification is the strength and, and how, whether um, it's, an, it's a standard or um, algorithm or not. Uh, so as um, I don't, didn't get the name of whoever was talking before me, uh, sorry, said that the mathematical, I mean, we're not talking about here making um, a, um, a judgment on whether something is okay or not okay, or, or to adventure a classification, an ECCN classification. What, what I just mean is, is this algorithm strong encryption or not? And, and that is something that, you know, is not a legal decision, it's more a mathematical, it's, it's just more a logic decision based on the, on the classification of the algorithm type. And, and that, is, that, that is something that doesn't exist today. And if there could be consensus on that, that would be great input for in, in a time saver and risk saver for everybody. That's a really good point because it's it's pretty unambiguous if something is you know sixty four bit or equivalent, and you can look at hey like it's the same as AES one two eight in terms of strength. And as you say, that's math. Uh, Mary, your hand is up. Yes, uh, I have more questions than on the answer today because I'm quite new in the export control area. I'm thinking, uh, is this uh, uh, available in certain industry? For example, the telecom areas, it's more like the, it can be used in the military uh, fields. But for the car, I'm thinking it's the opposite way. It's more like protect life, not kill people. I didn't mean the, the telecom is to kill people. But I'm thinking this in this industry or other. So let's say you sell in clothes, you build your website, let's say IKEA, for example, you use open source. But does it bother about this export control for the encryption and stuff? Uh, since today many companies don't do this anyway, but they still get this export export certification, I would say. It's such a good point. My understanding, and this is a very generalized understanding from a political scientist, so I'm in undoubtedly wrong, but my understanding is that adjacent to export control, we also have a separate topic, which is, is something classified as a weapon or not? And something that's classified as a weapon or dual use uh, is subject to more restrictions than other things. But the export control on cryptography will just apply to whatever industry is in play. Now that's very simplified and it is probably wrong, but I'm just uh, putting forward what I know so far. And if I'm incorrect, do feel free to uh, correct me. May I come in? Yes. Um, I think uh, with regard to software, open source software, and encryption. In, in real terms, what we'll be talking about will be dual use uh, goods, and therefore they are under export controls. If something is developed into a, a military product, it will then either be on the US uh, military equipment list or the EU military equipment list. Then you have a totally different ball game when it comes to export controls, and also what happens to whatever software you then include the site then. Um, in order for it to be military classified, it would need to be specifically uh, developed for military purposes, according to, well, essentially according to their criteria, and would also need to meet a couple of uh, technical uh, standards that are defined in the military control lists. So uh, it, if you go down that route and, and, and up classifying that, it is indeed military parts. Yes, then you will have a, uh, a much bigger challenge than you will have if it's uh, quote unquote only uh, dual use. 
Thanks. Fantastic. Daniel, thank you for that clarification. So useful. Now, we've had a bunch of links in. Uh, Stefan has found a definition of strong cryptography for the US. Excellent. Um, also, Jan has maybe found the right person for the list of country by country stuff we were looking for before. So I'm going to reach out and check if that is the right person. That's for this list from the crypto law survey. Uh, and Stefan has also pointed out there's a quick reference guide for the US classifications on this stuff like cryptography. Okay, everyone, good news. We've covered a lot of ground. Bad news, we are out of time. Bad news part two, naturally we don't have conclusions. It seems that we have a couple of points. One, a lot of people are interested in this. Two, we've got a lot of great links of existing resources. Three, tying resources together a little bit, at least beginning to describe the resources out there might be useful. And four, there may be some useful work we can do around identifying what can identify cryptography in open source software, for instance, like ScanOSS. And point two, identifying what algorithms are at least according to, let's say, one jurisdiction like the US, strong cryptography and normal cryptography. Now, this indicates we need to have another call. I suggest we have a call in around one month before Christmas uh, to take this conversation forward. I'm going to release this recording and summarize these links for our export control mailing list. Um, and the next call, I suggest that we try to pull the information together and work out what precisely we can contribute to and how we can do that. I will ask a favor for those of you on the call who are export control experts, uh, please think about the parameters of how we make sure the conversation is not misunderstood. So how we can put disclaimers on this so no one thinks that we're giving advice. And second part, for those of you who are not export control or not lawyers specializing in export control, maybe ask your company as well about how they think we can put parameters on this conversation to make sure that as we address it and if we make stuff, we're not inadvertently, not just crossing lines, but making people uncomfortable. We want to make sure everyone is comfortable and confident. Uh, and given the interest in this conversation, the amount of people on this call, we can do great work and we should do it in a way that encourages people to come to us and doesn't scare people away. <laughs> All right, everyone on the call, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, these links are great. There will be a summary email with them and the recording of the call. Thank you for your patience. Apologies for any of my missteps in interpretation or description. I am new to this as well. Have a beautiful day, take care, stay healthy, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in one month. Thanks, Shane. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, Shane. Bye.